Hi, welcome to Teen Pride Book Talks. My name is Lucy, and this is the program on AEDL TV, where each episode I take a few minutes to talk about one young adult book that is both inclusive of and representative of folks in the LGBTQIA plus community. The book that I chose to talk about today is called Forever Is Now, and this is by Mariama J. Lockington. This book won the Schneider Family Book Award in 2023. That is an award that goes to honor an author or an illustrator for a book that embodies an artistic expression of the disability experience for child and adolescent audiences. Forever's Now is a novel in verse, and it centers around a Black teenager named Sadie who is living in the historically Black neighborhood of Oakland, California. This is a neighborhood that, in reality, and in the story, is dealing with gentrification, which creates an increased police presence and then this looming threat of violence. This is very central to this story because we join Sadie in the beginning of this book, sort of in the middle of her story. She is getting dumped by her girlfriend in a park in Oakland. It's one of their favorite places to go. And at the time that she's getting broken up with by her girlfriend, Aria, she and Aria both witness a act of police brutality where a Black teen girl is violently arrested because she found a white woman's lost dog and helped return that dog. Witnessing this, along with all the other realities of Sadie's and everybody's world at this time, sets off in Sadie a panic attack. This is not the first panic attack that she's had. She is an extremely anxious person. She really suffers from a lot of anxiety, some of which is brought on by the fact that she has come of age in this anxiety-inducing world. She says, and this is a quote, ever since I was a kid, I've been grossly aware that my generation is inheriting a dying fucking planet. So before this incident in the park, she already had a very limited range of where she could go. The more anxious she got, the more her world closed in. She says, my anxiety was at an all-time high the last few months every week, my world shrinking to a minuscule collection of places. So these places did include that park where she was with her girlfriend. They also include a place called the Wright Center. The Wright Center is a literary nonprofit that Sadie and her brother and her mother had discovered some years before, and it became a very special and safe place to Sadie. This summer, she was going to have an internship there. So she was going to be helping with the elementary STEM writing camp. Not only was she excited about writing and about working at the Reich Center and about helping with this camp, but she also knew that she would be among a group of interns, which she refers to as a cohort of Alphabet Mafia, a.k.a. Hella Gay. Those are her words, but she was really excited to be in this queer space where she could be doing the things she loved and teaching other people. But because of her anxiety and her world closing in on her, she can't even go to this place anymore. Her brain is always just thinking of the worst case scenario to the point where it becomes intrusive. She continues to see her therapist, but over Zoom, her therapist tells her that what she is suffering from is called agoraphobia, which actually means the fear of fear. So it is a fear of leaving her house and going places, but part of that fear is fueled by the fact that she will experience fear when she's out in the world. At the start of this book, she really can't even take a step onto her front porch. She's very isolated. And now she's been broken up with. So a new family moves in next door who has a son who is pretty much exactly Sadie's age. His name is Jackson. Jackson is also Black. But Jackson was adopted by a white family. At first, he seemed pretty standoffish to Sadie, but she gets to know him better and she understands where some of that is coming from. And she starts to see some ways that they are both similar as far as internal struggles and things that they go through mentally and psychologically, and they start to feel a connection. Another place where Sadie feels really connected is on this social media platform called Ruckus. She posts there under one anxious Black girl, and she goes on and does these streams like at 1 a.m. where she'll just be talking about her anxiety and what's really going on with her. Some of the reasons about what is making her anxious, all the things going on in the world, and then also about what she witnessed with this girl, Corinne, who was the girl who was arrested 
in front of her at the park. This is a place where Sadie really starts to feel connected because people reach out during these live streams and either recognize that they're hearing her or share a similar experience. So the role of social media here is really crucial for Sadie because she can share something of herself and she can connect with the outside world. Sadie writes poetry. She loves to write poetry. And this even becomes a place where she's comfortable enough to start sharing that. She hosts these open mic sort of streams and encourages other people to share things as well. Her family, which consists of her parents and a younger brother, are generally supportive of her and try to help her with anxiety and understand that she can't leave the house they do get frustrated. Her father is really supportive and understanding throughout the entire book and is there for her in whatever way she needs. Her mother loses patience and doesn't really understand Sadie's reality. She sees that Sadie's able to go outside a little bit. And so in her mind, now she can go anywhere. And Sadie's brother, her younger brother, who she's very close to, gets frustrated when Sadie isn't able to show up for things that he's doing that are important or she promised she'd be there. A goal that Sadie has in mind for going out into the real world is to attend a protest for the arrest and the police brutality that she witnessed. People use ruckus to engage civically, and it's a place where protests can be organized. One way people are encouraging protests is through these flash acts so they can be organized, but nobody knows the location until right before it's about to happen. So Sadie and her best friend get the idea to also organize a flash act. Her best friend, who she's been friends with ever since she was little, is named Evan. They are also very supportive and are always available to be with Sadie in Sadie's safe spaces. So the people that Sadie sees in her daily life are either people that come into her house. She sees Evan. She sees Jackson. Once they start to become closer, she sees her family members. She has a lot of guilt about the way that she feels. I think she feels that she's letting people down, but her fear and her anxiety are are bigger than that. She and Jackson become romantically involved, and she does get a little bit frustrated with him when she realizes that he isn't in the same place as she is as far as marching for Corinne and really showing up and speaking out. Part of this is because he was raised in white spaces where he's learned just to not stir things up. The best way is to not get noticed. And then she has this supportive best friend, Evan, who is very like-minded with her in that way and is involved in these marches and always has been as outspoken as Sadie about issues around police brutality. But Evan is disappointed when Sadie and Jackson become involved. Though Evan knows that Sadie is bi, in their minds, once Sadie started dating Aria, a girl, Evan decided that they were a lesbian. And so Evan just really is questioning Sadie's queerness, kind of policing it and expressing disappointment in the fact that Sadie is now involved with a boy. Sadie's mother is the same way, except opposite. She's so excited for Sadie to have her first boyfriend. And she thinks that because Sadie has a boyfriend, she is no longer interested in girls. So the misunderstanding and the lack of support around Sadie's bisexuality is well represented in this book. And it's important to have that examination of how quick people are to dismiss Sadie's experiences. So there are all these forces around her that are just continuing to make Sadie feel even more misunderstood. Sadie realizes that in order to get out and do the things she wants to do, but also to be able to be present for people, she will have to start to take baby steps in order to work through her fear. And she's going to have to ask for help and support from a number of people for this. So she's going to have to really open up about it and tell people her true experiences with agoraphobia so that when she is able to even go down the steps of her house or 
take a walk around the block or ride a bus that she is with someone who understands how terrifying that is for her and is with someone who will help her that intense fear crops up and who will work their hardest to make that experience safe for her and also help her with an exit strategy if that experience feels unsafe. Part of what Sadie starts to learn about asking people for help is that help is going to look different from different people. And different people have different ways of being supportive a lot of times depending on what they are going through. So the coming of age piece of this novel is really multi-layered because Sadie is coming of age in this external environment where she really wants to make a change and make a difference and use her voice. But then to see this coming of age internally within her where she's learning how to live with her anxiety, but also surround herself with support and learn how to make people and spaces feel safe. I love that this was a novel in verse. The genre here allows Sadie's own poetry to be beautifully incorporated into the book in a really uh, organic way. And so it feels very natural. And it also highlights the importance of poetry as a means of expression and a means of power. There are some great resources at the end of the book, one of which is a list of Sadie's favorite poems. And there's a wide range of poems. So there we have Audre Lorde, Phyllis Wheatley. There's a couple Emily Dickinson poems. So it's fun to go through that list and also find those poems and read them on your own. There's also a playlist of songs. And then the author includes a resource that lists places specifically for Black women and Black queer people to get support for anxiety or other mental illnesses that they are experiencing. This book feels really relevant right now. And if you don't read a lot of novels in verse, I recommend trying out this genre. It reads very quickly, but it also is very immersive. So I would recommend Forever Is Now. Thank you for joining me.